But can you just take us right back to when little Jack uh, started working? Well, he's still quite little because I'm only five foot eight, but um, <laughs> I put you down as a large meal. Did you want to go super? And they've already put them as large. They've already they've already upgraded that 30p. <laughs> it's just whether they want that big cup. And I always had the supersized cup next to my till. So they knew what they were getting for value from catering vans to paper boy to any job that anyone would give me before I became of a uh, sort of 16 and was able to go out to the market, I would take. Welcome to the second episode of the Career Success Podcast brought to you by The Career Agent. So my name's Rory Lawton Scott. I am founder of The Career Agent and we help, well, we do two things. We help employers to achieve their vision and build the business they want by hiring the right staff who bring the right skills and personality fit for what they're trying to achieve in their business. And then on the other side, we help candidates uh, to with career coaching services and we help candidates to build a career that they love, that suits their passions and interests and uh, makes them happy. And ultimately we do that on both sides because I think the more people that can be happy in their job and in their work, the better place the world will be. If you're happy, your partner's happy, your family's happier. If you're confident in your job, you might help your friends, all that stuff. So I set up this podcast for a number of reasons. It's to help people out there because we all need a bit of encouragement and support. Job searching is horrific. Uh, it's a very lonely place with lots of rejections. So that's what this podcast is for. And to set the agenda for today, we're going to look at how you recognize your strengths and interests and adapt your career to what you like and what you're passionate about. We're going to talk about how to find the right culture where you can thrive. So the right business for you to do really well. Uh, we're going to have a quick chat about careers, what jobs are out there talking about sales and what industries are growing. And we're going to talk about sports as well, which a lot of people want to be in. And then lastly, how to job search and how to sell yourself. So today I'm speaking with Jack Beck, uh, head of sales and sponsorship at a company called Network My Club. Say hello, Jack. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Jack also has a what's called a side hustle. <laughs> or Jack Frames It, which is sporting memorabilia, which he's going to talk about. Now, the reason I've got Jack on the call on this uh, podcast is so many reasons, but in short, number one, he started at EDF Energy and sort of rose through the ranks there over eight and a half years. Uh, so he's done well at a corporate business. Number two, he's moved his career towards his passions, which is sports. Three, he's been in sales on and off for 14 years, I think. We'll, we'll talk about that. Mm -hmm. Four, he's thriving at his current company called Network My Club, and we're going to find out why. Five, Jack self-teaches a lot. You'll see him on LinkedIn. He's uh, he's taken his skills from zero to 100 there in a year, and we'll talk about that. And then six, we're going to talk about um, side hustles and how they can get you further ahead. So without further ado, Jack, please can you give us uh, some insight into your current job, what you do for Network My Club and what Network My Club is all about. Yeah, so I am the head of sales, which will cover membership, which is a subscription-based joining, as well as sponsorships, which is like a two products that I'm mainly responsible for, the real revenue generator for Network My Club. What we are is a networking organization that delivers exceptional networking events but we do them at sports stadiums, Twickenham, Amex, the Oval, across London and the South East. And that's really where we've built up over the last nine years, incredible relationship with sports clubs through our founder, Bradley, who used to work for Brighton Hove Albion and has identified a real opportunity that these amazing stadiums, when there's no football or rugby or cricket going on, are a wasted opportunity because there are incredible facilities and event space that, needs to be advertised to the local businesses. And that's where we come in and we bring local businesses, not only from the local area, but across London and the Southeast through our membership community to give our club partners exposure to businesses who then may go on and book a Christmas party or have a box for the day or entertain clients. So it's a real bringing sort of the SME sector together 
at incredible stadiums, but also from a sports perspective, bringing businesses to the club and really building that local community. Yeah, I've been to the the events there. They're brilliantly run, really well organised. Uh, it's epic locations to to mm. go to in order to network. But also, we took out at the Oval and Twickenham. We took out a box on a non match day and ran our meetings there, which gave it real focus. Mm -hmm. uh, we did a video at Twickenham as well in the end. Yeah, um, brilliant. So we're going to come back to that. Uh, we're going to talk awesome. through your career arc and then come back to your to your current job. But if you could also just tell me a bit about Jack Frames it your side hustle. Yeah, so uh, if you don't know, I'm a pretty big West Ham fan. I make a big deal of it. I went to Prague uh, back in sort of June last year to watch West Ham win the trophy. On the back of that, I had a Jared Bowen shirt that I fell in love with, but I wanted it to be on the wall on display so I could brag everybody time every time someone came over. I paid someone a vast amount of money to frame this shirt. And as I got the a few more shirts come through and I had an old Brighton shirt and an old West Ham shirt that I wanted framed, I thought I could do that myself or at least learn how to because I just didn't have the funds to do it again and again. Discovered how to frame my own shirt in a great way that looked great, but it was always simple. And then took a photo of it, showed a friend. He loved it, wanted me to do his shirt. And then from July, Jack Frames It was born and word of mouth got spreading that I was a Sussex-based shirt framer which had never really been done because it was always a service you had to send your shirt off in the post. So what I do is I take a football shirt, rugby shirt, cricket shirt, or even a marathon shirt, which is one I did recently, um, a vest. It was washed. And uh, <laughs> I display it in a frame with two photos and a plaque where you can have wording to really make that memory special. And I charge about £100 for that whole service and get that delivered back to you. And it enables you to take a shirt that you're no longer wearing, but means a lot to you and bring that to life and, and give it a story that people look at it on the wall and go, wow, where's that from? And um, 187 shirts in the last seven months, it, it's really taken off and um, people just love it. And I think a lot of us are in love when we're in sports, that we have a connection to a really old shirt that we wore with a family member or we wore at a certain time for a certain game that means a lot. And I'm just bringing those memories taking them out of a, of the wardrobe and putting them on the wall to um to really make that special. Love it. Love it. 180 set that's decent numbers. It's non-rookie numbers. So okay, so you so you love your sport, you love West Ham. Uh -huh. Um you you know you focus purely on one sport. You, you know, unlike me, you can't enjoy sort of cricket, rugby, all, all sorts of others. But we're I'll working like on it. As you, know. you like the tennis. You like the tennis. Um but so you so, so I speak to so many people in sport. Uh, or who, sorry, some people who want to get into sports. So the fact that you've found, uh, yeah, this is relevant for anyone with any passion in anything, you've mm -hmm. able to, you've been able to move towards that. So let's go all the way back to the beginning. I was going to say like the day you left school, but you're saying to me your sales career started before that. So can you just take us right back to when little Jack uh, started yeah. working? Well, he's still quite little because I'm only five foot eight, but um, <laughs> it started even from the likes of 10, 11 years old, I had a thing for popping to a charity shop on the corner of my street and looking at old plates and old things that I thought could be worth a bit of money. I always wanted to earn my own pocket money. I think it was probably uh, the old football sticker collection. I knew I had an addiction to that when I was young. I needed to fund it. So I always, from a very young age, but I first got into work um, when I was 12. Dad had a catering van. And I was working with him 6 a.m. on at car boot sales. Car boot sales, for me, where I got the passion from, the idea of people bringing something to a store and selling it for a value. And over time, I just got a bit obsessed with taking something that I'd purchased at a value and selling it for more, recognising undervalued items and, and replicating it. But from catering vans to paperboy to any job that anyone would give me, before I became of uh, sort of 16 and was able to go out to the market, I would take. And um, that kind of drive really got me into sales, whether it was just that customer service element and learning that people buy from people. And I had to become someone that people enjoyed being around so they would give me more leaflets to hand out. Or my dad would want to do another boot sale up in Henfield or another place where we could sell our burgers. But we we sold our burgers at cheaper than the other van. And we took all of the market and they weren't very happy, but we knew our margins and we moved with it. 
Um, and I remember he made a, a lot of money that day and gave me a tenner, which for me was important. <laughs> so it, all the way back from a dad uh, is where I started. So, I mean, it, I mean, maybe this is interesting for parents listening and watching, but like I got my first job when I was 18 and I wish it had been much, much younger than that because you learn a lot. So what do you think you learned from those first six years before you left school, you know, when you were grafting away, what did you learn from that? Well, my first ever job was while I was at college and there was a, a Burger King. and I took the job. It was £4.35 an hour, which is an incredible amount of money when you've got a bit of barely anything else. So I started my first proper job at Burger King three months. I'm proud of it because they work you to the bone and you learn incredible lessons. So I was fortunate or unfortunate that sort of from a financial position, my family weren't able to give the pocket money that I wanted. So I went out and got it in a job that was hard graft. Um, but I knew I had a knack for it because I think I broke the go large record for that store. So just to put that in perspective, if you're buying a Whopper meal, I would, you'd be buying a large meal. It would never be a medium. And that's where I was like, I love this. Um, but I got to start early on. And then during college, the university prices were going up. It was that year. There was a lot of pressure for everybody to go to university. And I just never had it in me. So I had a, a part-time job at EDF Energy while I was at college. And that part-time job went over for thought of three to four months where I'd go to college eight to three and then five to 10, I was at EDF. It was full-time, but I was getting money and I was in a big business. And then came the opportunity for a full-time opportunity that I had to then go, is it education or is it work? And I, and I chose the work and I chose the career. It was the best decision I ever made. When I walked back into college and gave in my books and said goodbye, all of my teachers said, yeah, that's the right move for you. And um, I think they could tell early on that I wanted to get to work and, and build experience rather than going down an educational route at that time. Okay, so, I mean, without getting into a debate about university, because I strongly, I do feel that, uh, you know, people go to university without really thinking too much about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually, a lot of people would be much better off just getting cracking with it. What I'm interested in, like from what you've explained so far, sport's a massive passion and then entrepreneurship uh, yeah. is also a huge passion. So what kept, you know, you could have, you could have said to your dad, I'm going to start my own burger van or, you know, pizza, whatever. Um, or you could have gone in with him, but, but you did eight and a half years at EDF sort of navigating that. So what drove that and um, what kept you there and kept you working hard? Because you, you you rose up the ranks at EDF and grafted. So what was it that kept you moving there? I had an interview with the agency that employed me at the time on behalf of EDF. And at the end, they said to me, have you got any questions for us? And I said, what's the career ladder like? From from my actual interview, I wanted to understand what's the, what does this look like? And they said, there's so much opportunity here. And I, I took that on face value and I got to experience through just everyday learning. I was so excited by it. And just throughout those first few years of just whatever was thrown at me, whatever department I was put in, I wanted to be the best so I could then help others become better. It was just something that I really got the knack for. And what kept me there was just constant opportunity to expose you to learning because EDF energy isn't just that energy bill that you get. It's how it gets there. It's the quality assurance behind it. It's the staff that deliver those phone calls and, and manage those emails. And it's a whole world of marketing. There's so much to it that I could get new. I could feel like it was brand new every week because there was so much to learn. And the, the beast that it was eight and a half years is a significant stint that I did because there was always a promotion opportunity for me that I really wanted because it came with extra money, but it also came with more responsibility that I knew if I learned this now, I'm investing in my future and I've got those skills. And um, I absolutely loved it. It was a third of my life that I spent there and the, the the coaching and the mentoring that I got to make sure that I took every opportunity and go for the jobs that might be out of reach for other people, but at least get myself interview experience at that level. And if I failed, which I had done many times, the worst case scenario is that I learned from it. And when the timing was right, I was right primed and ready to become a manager or to become a coach. And I absolutely loved every day of it. It was a, a real, um, it really enabled me. It's interesting, what, from what you've said so far, as I said, sport, entrepreneurship, learning, and you, you, know, you're, you really, really like to learn new things. Mm. And obviously sales is a big passion as well. But yeah. at EGF, you did, uh, you were performance, you know, coach, manager, 
um, the quality assurance as well as sales. So did it surprise you that actually you, you enjoy coaching other people and helping other people as well? Or, or is that really, that is what sales is, is helping other people? I think it surprised me because it probably was at that point where I got more out of delivering a coaching session that I saw went to fruition and resulted in a better performance. The feeling it gave me was surprising. And I think that was probably me maturing from just trying to grab the biggest pay packet every month to actually realizing that the long-term game is to have a bigger salary and sort of money becomes a bit more of a bonus than trying to grab that most amount. And um, I just got an absolute passion for helping others and seeing them grow. I don't know where that came from, but it's something I'm so glad I got exposed to. So being able to influence others, but also get better at sales myself was something that's important. It's so, so important to me. Well, that's something. So that's something you've done for me when, you know, uh, when we got to know each other uh, and network my club and I then ran a webinar and you jumped on it and were all over it asking questions. I mean, is this something that you if we jump back to today uh, in your current role for now, my club, you know, that you bring to uh, you, you bring to the members that network my club and to the people that come to the events. Are you still doing that stuff? Absolutely. Yeah. I think I've really developed a, and I've learned from a lot of people in the last year because I've learned from hundreds and hundreds of business owners who have taken that gamble and started a business and, and got successful at that point. And I've just learned that to build a network is one of the most valuable tools I've done and the amount of people I can now lean on, which now I've moved out of you know a, a thousand employee business to five. It's important that I've got those levers to people that I can speak to. And and what yeah, go on then. To talk about the journey, you were in a one thousand yeah. employee business, getting opportunities left, right, and center. Because this is this is something that people have to think about. Do I go in a corporate? Yeah. Where you know longer, bigger opportunities. Do I go a smaller company, autonomy, etc. And it's interesting. It sort of depends on the culture on each one. You can't say all corporates are like this, and all small companies are like that. Mm -hmm. However, for you, it sounds like you make the best you make the best of whichever environment you're in. Um, is that about right? Yeah, it's um I the first job I remember getting the job out after EDF and it was a smaller business, and you realize that the director's in the same room as you. And it was just it was an unheard of thing for me that you would be in, in a room full of senior senior managers that you normally have to they're in just another part of the country. So for me. Going from a massive business to a smaller business is, it's scary, but my God, is it exciting because you can have a voice that dictates and makes big changes. And you could, the way I've looked at it with Network My Club, because I know where we're going to get to, which is massive. Um, I'm in there early. I feel like I bought, I bought stock at a really good price and I, I'm the one that drives that price. So the pressure of it, knowing that, Yes, we're a smaller business now, but I'm going to be there when we are a massive business and be the one that looks back um, is very exciting. But it is important you know what you're looking for because it's completely different. There's a lot more accountability and a lot more pressure on you to really hold up a department, whereas you don't have a team of five or six to, to, to depend on when you're having a bad day. If you're having a bad day, everybody feels it. So um, I absolutely love it. And it's enabled me to influence a business and make changes that have, have massive knock-on positive effects. Whereas sometimes in a big business, it can take a lot of time to get a small idea off and running. You can get an idea off and running in 10 minutes. Yeah, which yeah, which obviously suits you because you like to move at speed, learn quickly, try yeah. things, try, fail, try, fail. Yeah. Um, so just uh, just back to you winning the Go Large record at Burger Kicks. So is that... <laughs> Was that was that in that specific branch? How many go large, extra large double whoppers did you have to sell for that? So just to, to simplify it, I remember doing my training. I was shadowing a guy, and he said, "Do you, he always said, do you want a large or a super meal?" And they would go, "No," um, because he was asking an open question, like a closed question. And yes, or no answer. Yeah. I then moved straight onto my tier, and I said, "Is that a?" a um, I put you down as a large meal. Or did you want to go super? And they've already put them as large. They've already they've already upgraded that thirty p. <laughs> just whether they want that big cup. And I always had the super sized cup next to my till, so they knew what they were getting for value. But I just learned that assumptive closing 
Um, and there were probably so, a lot of people who weren't that hungry who ended up stuffed accidentally. Um, so showing showing the customer what they're buying, which is with the big thing, exactly. but also going large, uh, being being a bit cheeky. Yeah, like a bit cheeky. And I've I've seen your CV that you also got uh, two record breaking months at Network My Club in terms mm -hmm. of members. So what? Just to do a highlight across your career, what are the one the big ones like that? Because I want what I want to get onto is how sales is a great yeah. career for people to choose. People look down on sales, but are there any other ones that come to mind? Like your, you know, your the most amusing or the best um, I'm proud of the 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 best moment. I will actually share a video with you because it was captured because I won an uh, award at EDF and like it was it was called We Want to Grow, which was like a an impact award. So who had the, the sort of the biggest impact at EDF? And I won that for the Southeast. Um, and it was one of the greatest experiences of my life to be recognised. Um, I never really realised until that point how much I like praise. I've always been a bit of a deliverer, but when I get it back, it's great. That's a massive highlight, winning a renowned prize. Um, I think in terms of huge achievements, probably from mainly from a personal perspective during COVID, it was a really challenging time, but I saw opportunity with my entrepreneurship and started a an eBay Amazon business and identified products in high demand and and got myself out of debt and then 18 months later bought a flat. And I think that's probably the most the most important thing for me. Um love it. Go love on it. To later. But really that stand out. I love breaking records, but then that's just another bar and that's another target to meet. And when I break that again, it feels great, but records are there to be broken. So um, I quite like being the one that, that smashes it, but then also rebuilding it and going again. So for me, I, I don't know uh, if this will resonate with you. When I, I did a couple of days volunteering at a school as part of a previous, previous job, and there were kids there who were mucking around funny, witty, and, you know, you could tell they were intelligent, but they weren't paying any attention to the, the subject matter because it didn't really appeal to them. Mm -hmm. And you can see that those people are, are cut out, I mean, not necessarily them, but when someone is cut out for a career in sales, but sales is seen as, you know, an evil, dark word, and it's still a used car salesman trying to sell, you know, the, the dad from Matilda trying to sell you a banged up old car that, you know, you shouldn't be selling. <laughs> yeah. But we've got, that has to change because I think it's an incredible career choice where you can help people, um, and you know it's the lifeblood of any business. So it, what I've talked for too long, but is that your thought on sales done well as well? If sales has a, has a stigma to it. Um, nobody wants to feel like they're being sold to. It's a real big thing, and how you work that out, sort of psychologically, to not come across in that way. Um, but you're in sales every day, whether you like it or not, because every email that you send is a representation of yourself that might result later down the line in that person referring you or leaving you. And every every interaction you have is is a representation. The sale is not just getting a deal over the line and celebrating and ringing a bell. Um, it's everyday brand awareness, and it's every day everything you put yourself out there for. Um, you're selling yourself, which ultimately attaches to the business that you're working for or own. So um, it definitely needs to change. And I would say that we're the majority of people are in sales and just recognize it and own it. And when you're trying to sell something. That person's been in the same boat a thousand times and just have that confidence that you're not there to sell something, you're there to give them a benefit that's going to give them a, something that's worth purchasing. Yeah, I, that's exactly it. Is I know I can help you. The old cliche is, you know, you're approaching someone who's about to run a marathon in flip-flops, but you've got the Nike trainers, yeah. uh, other brands are available. Like you've got the trainers in the bag ready to help them. So you're helping someone solve a problem. You're not trying to sell them something they don't want. Um, exactly because that would be a waste of your time and theirs. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so let's talk about your journey to get into sport, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with your side hustle and with your main, yeah, and with your full-time job. Like, is that by design or was it lucky? Like, how did you manoeuvre that? Timing and a bit of luck and a bit of, bit of badgering, I would say. So I met Bradley, the owner of Network My Club, who was involved with my previous employee um, employer, I met him in the kitchen and we got chatting and I'd always followed Network My Club and found it interesting just through the stadium and the awareness. But we got talking sort of January last year and um, it just so happened that an opportunity were to arise three weeks later, but I'd already 
met him and had a bit of a conversation. And when he put that job up, I didn't just press apply. I messaged him on LinkedIn and I said, can we, can we ever talk about this? Because I'm in another role and I'm looking to move, but I'd like to actually get to know exactly what you're looking to do. And I think that proactivity really done well with him. Um, but I think that's a very, very good job, job searching tip because people don't do that, but it makes a massive difference. Yeah, it, I, I've, I've seen that before. It can come across as too keen. Trust me, from a, I've recruited and, and employed people before. It's really nice to bring that job description to life. And it might actually save us both a bit of time later at an interview stage to know actually are we right for you. And it helps. I think that that off the record call can almost get straight to the point and have a really nice, honest conversation. But going back to it, I didn't really know how much I wanted to be in sports until I was in sports and how exciting it is. And that with with energy having multiple sort of branches to the tree, sports is just unlimited an opportunity through sponsorship, partnerships and all of the above. And, and just to put a football game on the impact and how to get that set up, it just fascinates me. So um, I think I wanted to get into sports and then meeting Brad, I, ha I just had to get in. So for me, I mean, and the top tip for me is that you showed your passion to Bradley by going, look, I really want, you know, I'm really keen to talk about this. And if if a candidate sees a job they want, the, the issue we're in at the moment is we're in the era of the one click apply. So just it's apply. Not. Your CV goes in, there's 200 CVs, and then the person hiring goes, bloody hell. And they may not even open more than the first 10. You just don't know. But if yeah. you show that interest and that effort, your CV will go to the top of the pile because they're going to go, let's have a little look. At the very least. So it's 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 sales tips, really, isn't it? Yeah, and subconsciously, if your name is in front of the decision maker before they've even seen that name, they're going to recognise it and it's going to stand out. And they may not even remember why, but something will kick in. Um, it's a really tough market. I remember being out there in the job market for the first time and I had this incredible CV. I thought it looked really good. I just wasn't getting the response. And I think that's what, because I was trying to have a great CV for everyone rather than a great CV for who I actually wanted to read. Um, and then I realized tailoring what I had to actually who I want, who's going to read it is the best way for it rather than casting a massive fish in net. I was only going after the salmon. I don't even know if that makes sense, but if, 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 hopefully you catch that. No, it, uh, it makes perfect sense. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's another, it's a top tip from you there is if you can... So, but people write CVs thinking, let's make it as generic as possible and say, I can do all these things. Whereas actually you've got a laser focus down on, okay, I'm great at sales. I know I'm good at sales for this and I'm passionate about your job and this is why. And you can edit your CV for every single job that you apply for. Yeah. But people tend to think, let's just make it as generic as possible and say, I'm good with people. I'm, I work well on my own. I work well with others. And just things that everybody says but you don't stand out from the crowd and show why you're different. Um, uh, I don't think that's anybody's fault. I think that's just how we've all been trained. There's never really been that significant time spent on getting that CV and what employers are looking for. A lot of people guess. Um, and it is a difficult market to understand, actually. By pr the CV looks great, but if you, if you could see the employer's view as soon as you press send, and get that feedback immediately it would be incredible but we just we, we guess a lot as job seekers so i always go back to would you rather just have 100 random leads and go after all of them or would you rather have 10 high quality leads that are relevant to you and there's an, op an opportunity that you know more about i would always go for the smaller amount where i've tailored my cv or my covering letter or i've reached out on linkedin for a smaller amount you're going to have a better chance if that makes sense it does. It does. OK, so there's there's two more questions which we've kind of covered already. So normally I would yeah. ask, um, were there any tells in your childhood that links to your current career today? You've kind of already answered that. And I also the next one's going to be how did education help you get to where you are now, if at all? Um, you've also kind of answered that. But across those two, is there anything else you want to pull out? Yeah. So you mentioned earlier about sort of university and I think just my background on it is that only one person in my entire family history has been to university. So I just didn't have that path laid out for me. I loved college and I was interested in sociology and business. Business studies was the number one thing that was interesting for me. Um, I only didn't go to university because I took a part-time job 
that could develop into a full one, full time one. If I wasn't presented with that opportunity, would I have gone? I don't know, but I know I would have pursued my passion, which would have been business of some sort. So if I could go back, I'd love to have experienced university and I think it's incredible value, but I've never had that because I thought I'd rather learn. And I, I guess being on the other end now, having experience of doing a job versus someone who's got that in theory, you do have a bit of an advantage, but it also depends on that employer. So it's a really tricky one to know what, what the best one is. Well, what, so what I think if there was a, if, if we could set a perfect world, Mm -hmm. then really we would all go to university at 30 because at that point yeah. you're making you're making strategic decisions or you're in charge of people and you need to learn the theory that you learned when you were 20 mm -hmm. you're so too young for it but that's what brings me on to my next point which is i know you're doing a digital marketing is yes. it a dip diploma it's like a a college course foundation level two so it's pretty in depth um but it's like a funded thing by the government so it's it's pretty meaty so you're 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 all over LinkedIn for Network My Club, uh, which is, and your content is, for me, excellent. It's engaging, it's funny, it grabs your attention, it's light, but with an a, important message. So I guess my next, yeah, my point is that sort of continuous learning and putting yourself through that uh, course is just fantastic advice for people out there. I don't know if you'd agree. Yeah, so I think I've, in the last year, I've, use LinkedIn as almost a social diary to diarize my new career in sports and, and showcase what that looks like to be a little bit different, but also just to maybe for me to reflect and look at my year as, as a way of going, that's what I did. Um, the reason for sort of the digital marketing is I go on LinkedIn and I might have really good engagement, but it's not necessarily to generate anything, but I can then scroll one more and there's an incredible post that's really well written and that's got incredible reaction and, and so much value when you read it and I want to know how I can be that whether that's through content or the way that I I market myself I've done everything I can for organicness and I actually want to go a bit further and try to put myself at the top and work down and what does what is it how does great content get seen and what does that mean across all platforms and I think just to be honest with you I, I'm fascinated by the idea of scrolling through a social media app and an advert pops up I actually want to know where that came from and why. So I, if I want to do an advert, I can do it. And that's something I'm looking at doing is taking my side hustle and, and creating an advertisement and spending a bit of money at some point this year. So what, so what I'd like to point out there is another one of your strengths, which is being so open to learning. So for me, if I, if I scroll through and I see someone LinkedIn post has got a hundred likes and loads of comments, I get this sort of, Oh, for God's sake, you know, they they theirs has performed better than mine. And I then grumble and then move on. Whereas you, your mindset is why is that's gone better? Why is that? Let's learn why. Yeah. And I think, and I just think if you, if I was pulling out a top tip from the way that you work, that applies to anyone listening to this it's having that mindset of you know of no of no ego all the rest of it just that's done better i'm open to learn about it if there's always someone better than you at someone and that's not from a competition point of view it's just they've kept going there's it's always a race right and you just need to keep learning and one of our core values at network my club that brad preached to me from day one is being open to learning and recognizing when you're not at the at your top, what can you do? And whether that's speaking to a colleague or actually going on an external course or reading certain content or books or podcasts, there's always more that you can learn. And it could just be that one nugget of information that changes everything. And you don't know what it is until you've read it or you've listened to it. And that's what really excites me. Um, and I've just through this course that I'm understanding so, so much about metrics and what's important, what's not, but I just, I love it. And uh, if people have enjoyed what I've written on LinkedIn, it's just been my brain and how I've tried to do it. But now I want to do it strategically so it's even more valuable. And that's what I want people to come across my profile and go, that was valuable five minutes that I read certain things on. And, I, and I've seen you sharing what you've learned back to your network um, and to Network My Club members. So I'm pleased that you brought up Network My Club. So I'd love to just talk about, you know, the next part of this podcast is about culture and how to find a company that suits yeah. you, how to find a great culture. So we talked about Bradley as a leader. Um, so do you mind giving us an insight into how he, because, you, you know, for me, I remember talking to him when, when he hired you and I was like, he's a very talented bloke, Jack. You need, you know, you're going to need to empower him. 
So do you want to just go like talk through how Bradley leads in that leads you, I suppose? Yeah. Um, from day one, he set out very clear about how he works and the culture that he's created. He was very big on culture, which is a word that you do hear a lot. But when you experience it and, and see it day to day, it just, I really had that opportunity. And I knew it interview because I asked him, will I have the opportunity to have a voice? It was really important for me. I don't know if you know, but I'm quite loud, not just to speak, but in terms of I have a lot of opinions or innovations that I just need to test or be heard so we can move forward with it. And he's been so open to being challenged and giving me the tools I need to go and get the job done. Not what did you do today? It's how can I help you with what's going on? Um, and his approach is what can I do to support? And whether that's him supporting or putting you in touch with someone in his network that I could spend 20 minutes with, he's just constantly about, Jack, go and, go and grow the membership. Let me know what you need. Keep me in touch and go. Um, and autonomy is is massive. Didn't realise how much I, I loved it to be able to find a, a solution to a problem that someone else didn't even know and just present that um, and go, yeah, and Brad will just go, great, let's do it. But he's So he's encouraging you to keep learning and learning is one Absolutely. of your core values. Um, yeah. But also, so a top tip for me for employers listening to this. So um, for me, people will leave jobs and they'll say, I left for more money because generally their next job pays them a little bit more because that's yeah. how the job market works. But in reality, people leave because they don't feel listened to. They don't feel like they've got a voice. Their relationship's broken down with their manager and they can't say what they think. And they don't feel like they've got autonomy. And yeah. that is why that's the reason people leave. And, you know, they do, for all those reasons, they don't see a future for themselves at the company. It's not money is a byproduct. That's the main thing. So if Bradley is doing those things for you, he's basically saying, Jack, keep learning. And and also you can challenge. And for me, if you can challenge the founder and come up with ideas, then it feels like you're partly running the business. Yeah. And I almost say to him sometimes, like, Brad, it's when you it's not your business, it's ours because we're part of it and yes you're paying us but i want to be partners with you i want to be there every step of the way as we grow and grow and grow so it i take it personally everything that goes well and that doesn't you're not alone and it's just that real everything has an impact both positive and negatively and just working really close together one thing i would say which i've always given my friends the advice of is if you're out there looking for a job i remember looking at a salary for a certain job and don't get distracted by a salary because you're only going to get paid that if you actually work there for 12 months. What's more <laughs> important is actually, can you get past the first three months? Is it the right place for you? So don't get, don't get excited by a salary because that's a year of your life that you're committing just to hit that number. Be yeah. And I, I think that's a very, very good tip and it brings it to life um, yeah. because people don't spend much time thinking about, well, what culture is right for me? Um, and, I guess one thing we could think about is how did you spot? I, I, okay, you spotted that the culture was going to be strong by the way that Bradley approached the interviews and the way he answered yeah. the question. And I think people can sometimes go, the salary's good, it'd be a good opportunity for me. And then they just sort of blur out the rest of the information. There's some unknowns mm -hmm. and they go, I'll give it a go. I'll make, I'll, is there anything to be said for you doing that? Like, I don't want to name names of companies, but after EDF, um, any yeah. lessons? Yes, there were. I, I, there's been a couple of roles where culture made me. I it made me feel like on a Sunday night I had this feeling in my stomach that wasn't right because I had to to face certain people or knowing that I'd be that a certain email was coming or a certain treatment was happening. It was just bad culture. It doesn't matter how much you're getting paid. You that is unsustainable, and it's important you know where you fit into that culture because culture can be bad or good. Everybody's got one. They just don't know what it's being measured at. Um, so I've had some bad experiences and I can tell you, and I'm sure my missus can as well, that I come home from work some days and I would dread going back. Not because I couldn't do the job, but I just couldn't see that future. And I was feeling very, very out of place. And that was a great salary, but that did not last long because it wasn't right for me. Yeah, I understand that. I understand that. Okay, so to move on to the next section, which is uh, industries, so like industries as in sport, but also job roles. Uh, we've talked a bit about sales, but I wondered what your top tips were to build a career in. If you think you might be interested in sales, 
how do you build a career in sales? One big tip of advice. So for new people or younger generation or people just want to get into it, don't just go into sales to sell anything. Find an industry that actually interests you because you can sell a million different things. But is that insurance? Is that a cars? Is it something? Find an industry within sales that's a product that you can get excited about. Because if you can't get excited about it, it's going to come across in your tone of voice or your body language. And it, you'll get a bad impression and it might ruin your sales career for a long time because you went in to sell cars because there was a dealership down the road but you actually just don't like you you, you can't even drive yourself you know it's not a big thing for you you yeah. much prefer an office environment and you're better on a headset rather than face to face like work out your strengths and what you like and then pursue sales in that sector don't just go for a sales role that you see sales exec on uh, a, a website and you apply for it what sector is it in can i get does that get me up in the morning and can I sing about it? And um, that's so important. That's always been important for me. Which uh, which is a top tip, like sell something you you love or sell something you're interested in. Uh, and also for me, you've got to like the customers. You've got to like the people you're selling to, ideally. Um, so that's, go on, sorry, go on. Was, you never know who you're going to sell to, which is so exciting. And you never know who that person is and how you're going to make their day. And what they'll say positively about you and the referrals you might get on the back of one amazing customer experience. One conversation can lead to 10, can lead to a hundred people talking about you. So um, every conversation is great and you never know who you're going to meet. Okay. And then uh, next, so no, my club is obviously an events based business. So I just wanted to have a quick chat about events since COVID and we all in COVID, we all sort of thought that the world was changing uh, yeah. And we realised that it wasn't. But what's your what's your thoughts on in person events now? Um, in terms of like doing business with with each other? Yeah, so it's it's really interesting. So when I joined, we were still hosting a couple of online events. It was still a bit of a hangover from COVID. Um, but those event numbers online was were just on the decline. But in person event bookings were way up and we identified through speaking to members and just getting to know people that they were ready to get back in and meet people again. Um, and I know that Brad transformed Network My Club, which was a predominantly in-person business. And if he hadn't made that change at COVID, we wouldn't be where we are. And I think he changed it from Network My Club to Network My Pub and turned it onto online and meetings to get everybody together, to keep, keep, keep a community together, but also to save his business. Um, so he's got a bit of a reputation that's really helped us to go back in when everybody was ready to go in. That's why we're seeing events sell out quicker than ever. The demand for face-to-face -face interaction has, has, I've never seen anything like it. Love it. Um, the next thing is you're not, you know, you're not afraid of a side hustle. Uh, and obviously Jack, Jack frames it is, uh, is something similar to that. So I just wondered like how a side, how side hustles have helped your main career or just help you to be happy in what you're doing, to be honest, because it, for me, you know, there's example, a, a top tip for anyone wanting to get into marketing, for example, is anybody could get into the marketing as an industry if they do a couple of courses, free courses, but also approach small businesses in their network and say, I'll help you for free. And if you can help them, you know, loads of small businesses need support in marketing. Yeah. You can build, and, and this is my point, like if you want to change your life, a side hustle can help to do that. And Massive. and what's yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear a bit more about your side hustles over the years and, and how it's changed yours. Using my spare time to go and generate more money and more opportunities and, and build a network is something that I've done. The, the, the best example I can give was a pretty damn good 18 months. So for those that are listening, during COVID, if you struggled to get a PlayStation 5 or an Xbox, that's probably because I bought them all. Um, <laughs> I identified... I got a bit obsessed with supply and demand and I started to recognize pe what people would want when they couldn't leave the house and understood those products and PlayStation 5s, Xboxes, hot tubs, weights, dumbbells. If it was in high demand, I would get it and I would build network at Curry's, Argus. I would meet people and get to know them so they would text me when the new PlayStations were coming in and I ultimately went from, in COVID, I had a little bit of debt. It was a really weird time being on furlough I saw an opportunity to to buy a product at a certain price that I could see on eBay were going for more. And if I could get them at this price, they were guaranteed to sell. Um, 
And I started a, an, an Amazon business where I sold an Amazon for two years, had an eBay business store. Um, I had my own membership group that I ran for about a year, which was incredibly exciting. And it all came from me just going out and go, trying it, buying a product for this price and trying to set it for that price and snowballing. Um, but I just spot opportunity and I spot it everywhere. And if I had a hundred hours in a day, I think I would do a lot more, but everything that I look at, I think, could that be better? Um, Can you think of skills you've learned on the side hustle and then brought back to the main job? I think my eye to spot opportunity, whether that's through a physical product or a service has been massive and being able to spot a gap in where that service is not being delivered to its core audience. And I found that through our framing service. And you can right now take your football shirt, put it in a postage bag and send it off somewhere to get it done. But where I've kind of moved back a little bit is I started just in Sussex. If you've got a football shirt that means so much to you and you post it and it's gone, doesn't matter what money you get back for that, that's gone forever. So I identified if I could get people to give me their shirts in person and I gave them the shirt in a frame back in person, they know that that, chain of ownership was only through me and I could build trust. Um, and that's something I've really sort of pushed on. And there was so much opportunity where I live with Brighton doing so well that people just wanted to come and give me their shirt. They trusted me and I would give it straight back. And um, I absolutely love it. And I've got a lot of ideas, but I'm also learning to walk before I run, which has been a, a big thing for me because I love to sprint and fall over. <laughs> <laughs> it's well, not helpful. They fail fast, don't they? But um, yeah, of course. You've obviously, you've obviously learned the balance there. Yes. Um, but if I was to summarize, any advice I would give is find something that you love, that people could think that you love and it would come across well and start small. I didn't, I started with a, a 50 pound that I put towards a budget and I, I purchased some framing bits and then I, I built something. And I just put it out there. There are so many tools that you have that are free to use that people will see. And you only need the one person to go, I like that, tell me more. And for that to snowball. And that's what it's done. Uh, so I've made that mistake, start small. Uh, so you you think to start a business, I need a building, I need an office, I need multiple, three people, four people, so that people take it seriously. Uh, I need to, a website, all the rest of it. It's it's all absolute nonsense, If you know, in terms of, side hustle or start a business or or what i was going to talk to you next about was just you know it's not all being plain sailing your whole career and when you fall on harder t and, and this is why i want to help people who fall on harder times with their career how do you get out of that and and this sort of venture is what is a, is another top tip is like you can try things and then in the next interview you can say i got made redundant but this is what i've been doing so, you know, instead of i've been job yeah. searching for three months I tried this, I've learned that, this is what skills I've got, and I've had these either successes or I've achieved it. And so that's what I want to talk to you next about how you've got yourself out of those harder times. Yeah. Um, I think from, so uh, COVID, I was working for an aviation recruitment company. It was going amazing well, but aviation COVID did not get on. So that yeah. stopped immediately. Yeah. 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 I spent six months on furlough and I was living in London away from my family and I had to move back home leave the job and go out and it was covid there i had no money coming in um and it was really really tough and i at first i was you know going back to my old ways of one big cv send it to everybody and hope it hope it gets caught and it just wasn't and i wanted to recognize what i was actually good at and what i could sort of put on my cv and make them go yes this person's perfect for me and it was recruitment and rather than applying for loads of different jobs and trying it, I knew when I got home, I'm going to go back into recruitment. So my CV is going to look like I'm the world's best recruiter to the level that I can. And then when that hiring manager looks at me going, yes, they don't need to worry too much about Burger King. They don't need to worry about all of that. What's, his, what's he been up to and how has he kept himself busy? And I also think that you're so right at that end of an interview where someone says, have you got any questions for us? Yeah, I always give so many opportunities that's a conversational part but keeping yourself busy and having evidence will be really helpful in an interview well so i i think uh boredom is the best breeding ground for depression that there is and so my point is like you doing those side hustles you you go hang on we i've got a client of ours who 
uh, fits fits out vans. When when COVID hit, his business dropped. So then he became a mobile mechanic like that. So he could go out and go to, and and it just instantly, you know, there was so much drive for that. The the demand for that boomed, and he knew it would. It's adapting. Yeah. But for me, your your side hustle when you're on harder times, you got on you got on with it, made some money at it, but also your confidence your ability to do things stays high. And I'm not a huge believer in the word confidence. I'm, I'm a big believer in the word momentum, which uh -huh. is, which is keep, if we keep going, keep our brains busy, keep trying things, stuff will come around. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So the only, yeah, okay. So we're getting to the end. Be pleased here. Um, <laughs> what tips about job searching, if any, or about, or about your career and where you've ended up, would you give to young Jack? I would say to him, take your time choosing that first job and put yourself in the biggest deep end of possible as you can when you're young. Don't go the safe route while it's while you're at home or if, you, if you've got a bit of a safety net. Um, jump in the deep end with both hands with no armbands and force yourself to learn how to swim in a really difficult environment whether that's a large corporate or something that you're not used to you will learn unbelievable skills um and you can take that from me as someone who's flipping burgers at 16 absolutely stinking of grease but i learned so many skills so um just go out your comfort zone as early as possible is what i would definitely say such a big thing yeah there was a motivational speaker called james brown that said the harder you make your life the easier your life will be as in the, the more you challenge yourself. Um, but you've brought you so just to do some sort of summary, which I'm going to attempt to do. So yeah. you you've brought up taking your time, choosing that first job. You brought that up twice as sort of being stepping back and being strategic. So we talked about sales, choose a product that you're passionate about. And I've spoken to, yeah, you know, I would say 70% of people are in jobs where they go, yeah, it's all right, but they don't love it. And and that's that's an absolutely enormous figure. So you yeah. said, you've said take a step back and um, and you know and and be strategic about the decisions you make. Uh, for me, it's learning that's the biggest passion for you. And even when you feel like you've learned everything, you can almost you can almost move on too quickly because you're so sort of keen yeah. to learn. Uh, and maybe that's quite useful for, to always have a side hustle going because it's just somewhere to put your energy to be to be learning all the time. Yeah. Um, but clearly, if you look back to your passions as, as a as a youngster, going to those car boot sales, and then going to West Ham probably with your dad, yeah. and now you're you're doing something entrepreneurial. You're also working an entrepreneurial business within sport that's all about sales, uh, hustle. It's all about learning as much as possible. But also, you're help a network. My club, you're helping all of the other. Uh, all of the client companies to meet each other and connecting and on LinkedIn not only are you educating people about the benefits of Network My Club you're also sharing your knowledge constantly yeah. Um, yeah so to me it's like it makes sense if you if you you know if I said how happy are you today career-wise you'd probably say nine or eight or nine or ten right yeah. out of ten would you say that as of right now it's a it's a ten and that's based off the last four weeks uh, and sort of getting a little promotion and, and now being a manager again with, with Cameron and my new team. And just because Brad's given that vision of where we're going to be in the next, by the end of this year, and we will be there and it's very exciting. So it's, it's a 10 for me. That's so I think, okay, so I think the fact that you've got a 10 is what it's all about. And I would, I don't see why more people shouldn't have a 10. I think you have recognize your strengths over the years but you've grafted and got outside your comfort zone and been open to learn consistently and we talked about how you're you're more open to learn i think than i am maybe being a bit hard on myself but i'm just maybe. trying to i'm just trying to recognize your strengths so you win that one but also bradley the way he leads you and empowers you keeps you happy so i think in terms of that little snippet and this podcast there's so much that an employer could think about how to recognize people's strengths and give people trust um but also from an individual's perspective thinking about a career in sales or even you know what the hell should i do with my life um you've given a huge amount of insights into you but some top tips which is be open work hard follow your passion 
be really, really open to learning. Do some additional learning, try things, test, fail, test, fail, and retire your ego. Um, and you might just reach that 10. Yeah, and just be open to feedback. Please just, if, if, if it's bad or good, it's always to benefit you. Um, and I've always been open to being challenged. And if you can create an environment where you, you and your team are openly challenging each other and it's healthy, there's going to be amazing things that come out of that. The only thing I'll caveat that with, people also say, so what if the feedback isn't right? Um, and what the way that you can, that's the only place I went to is, feedback's fantastic if it's from someone who should be giving you that feedback. Yep. But there's another expression, which is don't take feedback from someone from whom you wouldn't seek advice, which is quite a good one. Because what oh, happens is, people get stuck in a culture where they're just criticized even though they're actually good and so they can't see the wood from the trees and so that's an interesting tip for anyone who isn't you know you can't build confidence when you're in a poor culture but then the way you've 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 recognized those cultures and then done things to get out of it which is yeah. um so just to just to finish off is there one I've, I've we've kind of already finished it but is there anything else just one piece, piece of advice you want to give to others or do you think we've uh, you think we've nailed it i think we've covered so much but i guess that the big piece of advice is work out what really excites you and follow it i love sports i love football and i did my best to follow that and it took me a while to get there but when i got there i'm now i feel incredible so really make sure you figure out what excites you and how you can get involved in that and make your passion uh, your job and beyond. It, it just really helps. If you're excited to get up at work on a Monday morning, you've cracked it. Perfect. Well, thanks very much for being the second guest on the podcast. My pleasure. And uh, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. I really did. Thank you for inviting me.